Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 48, 2020, The Year in Review, featuring Christine Mattis. Christine Mattis returns to the show as a co-host of this special year-end episode. Christine has a PhD in environmental studies. As an interdisciplinary environmental scholar with a background in biology, earth system science, and policy, her research focused on environmental risk information and science communication. Before returning to graduate school, Christine worked as a medical researcher, as a science reporter for the U.S. Congressional Record, and as a science and health teacher. She has no relation to the Mad Dog General. We had a lot of subjects in our wide-ranging discussion, including where each of us spent the year, the question of whether 2020 was, quote, the worst year ever, the George Floyd uprisings, the blind spots and biases of the mainstream media, censorship on social media, the presidential election, the lack of effective anti-war and pro-environmental movements in the United States, the need for big picture thinking in the environmental movement, a nuanced look at COVID and vaccines, the cultural provincialism of U.S. society, the ecological unsustainability of the Internet's infrastructure, and the delusional hope that a change in the calendar date will make a positive difference all by itself. Please support this podcast by subscribing, by sharing it on social media, and by reviewing it where you can. If the mood strikes, you can make a one-time financial donation at paypal.me slash colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. You can also become a member at patreon.com slash colibri, where you'll get early access to most episodes, as well as other exclusive content. For more information on my other multimedia projects, visit radiofreesunroot.com. Follow Christine's Fly Observations on Twitter at Christine Mattis and her writing at Medium and at rebelpleb.blogspot.com. Today's music features two loops by Dr. Dream Chip of Portland, Oregon. See the show notes for how to follow their work. And now, here is our look at 2020. So we had come up with a list of things together that we thought would be fun to talk about in like sort of a wrapping up uh, 2020 episode. I, so I'd had the idea that maybe we could start just by just kind of telling people where we were this year. So that that'll help give people an idea of uh, why we have the perspectives that we do. So specifically, you mean geographically? Yeah, I thought that, yeah, mm-hmm. and just like, yeah, and here's what I was doing for money or how I wasn't making money or, you know what I mean? Just sort of a... Yeah how it was for us personally kind of thing, you know? Sure. So I, I'm i in the New York uh, metropolitan area, the tri-state area, as we say, around here, um, a little north of New York City. And I moved here um, probably not, not long before the pandemic um, to take care of my mother, who is suffering from Alzheimer's right now. Um, so I had been out of this area for um, about almost exactly 30 years. Oh no, I actually exactly 30 years. And, um, and so that was my primary thing I was doing when this came about this pandemic. Um, I've always had, a, a um, well, it's interesting. You just wrote a wonderful article called the end of stability. I, for me, it wasn't the end of stability because I don't think I've ever really had stability. I'm people I think who've been fighting for, um, the environment and trying to align their lives with environmental concerns have a hard time, I think, having a, a stable kind of middle class American life. But um, anyway, so I came here and to take care of my mother. And um, 
I have since, uh, unlike a lot of people who lost their jobs, I have since started a job um, not not really in my field um, in education, which I've done a lot of. Um, so unlike a lot of people, I have to say I'm fortunate that I have a roof over my head and food to eat, and I can say that um, I'm fairly secure and able to keep myself safe and keep my family safe. But, um, but it's still, you know, it's always a struggle and it's especially a struggle to be a caregiver in these times and in any time, because that's something that I, that, that's a whole nother podcast episode actually about how many people are, um, caring for elderly parents and loved ones in this time because so, so many people, um, in their elderly years come down with various ailments, but particularly dementia. And we don't have a system in place to deal with any of that. And the system that we have is so costly and unaffordable for most people. And also just fairly horrific for the person, the people involved. But anyway, that's where I am. And, and being in the New York area, um, the metropolitan area, we experienced this pandemic probably first. We were the epicenter of it when it really started in the U.S. Um, and I think because of that, I would say most people here are generally more cautious, although that has kind of faded as time has gone on, and especially for the holidays, because everybody want, wanted to participate in the regular consumerist um, capitalist extravaganza. So I think a lot of the safety went by the wayside because of some of that. But long story short, that's basically where I've been for 2020. Right, right. Yeah, I, I started off 2020 in the place that I still am, which is a friend's rural property in southwestern New Mexico, definitely in the boonies, like the closest grocery store is a 30 mile drive away. And wow. Yeah, and there are neighbors. There's a neighbor on either side, but then there aren't neighbors again for like a half mile or a couple miles after that. It's very much a uh, socially distanced spot, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I'll go days or even weeks at a time without seeing anybody other than the other two people who live on the property, which is the landowner, who's my best friend from Portland, and then another friend of mine, Nikki Hill, who we used to do farming together. Mm -hmm. We've done wild tending stuff together. She's going to be coming up on the podcast as a guest pretty soon. And I just mentioned her because I know a lot of my listeners already know her and follow her on social media. And so it was interesting for me because last summer, 2019, I was in Northern California. And the last few years, I've made my money doing seasonal agricultural work, i.e. working on cannabis farms. You know, And I remember I kept having this feeling that would pop into my head maybe once a week or so that was that was very simple it was just this is the last summer of its kind enjoy it hmm. and i was like hmm what's that mean you know is that is that just a message for me personally or is that a greater message or what because i have had similar kind of premonitory thoughts before in my life you know and yeah. so i paid attention to that and i had a really good time last summer just kind of enjoying you know things in a carefree way as much as i could you know and mm -hmm. then and then over the winter, I was in New Mexico. I was here at this property. Every once in a while, someone would ask me, you know, oh, what do you think of that place? And I'm like, well, you know, it'd be a good place to get stuck, you know, if you had to. And, yeah. when, I, and when I would say that, I would get this funny feeling in the back of my head of like, wait a minute, am I going to get stuck here? And then, <laughs> and then sure wow. enough, yeah, then the pandemic comes along and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I feel like I saw this coming, like not specifically this, but I felt something coming. So I ended up being here and I have a lot of farming experience. And so mm -hmm. I was like, okay, there's two and a quarter acres here and there's some fenced gardens. Let me see how much food I can grow here. And I got to be a pretty good food grower up in Oregon. So I put like all of my effort over the spring and the summer into like trying to grow food here. And like, well, this is a harsh environment. It was already in the 90s on a regular basis at the end of April. Triple digits by June or July. It's like a desert grassland is the ecotype. And then the monsoons are supposed to hit in the summer and they never did. Yeah. And it turns out this was the driest monsoon season on record. And mm -hmm. of any farm year I've ever had, I've never put in more work for less return. I put in so much work and got very close to nothing back. I mean, 
something. Uh-huh. I got something back, but my failure rate was something like 75%. Things were just struggling. And it was like, wow, okay. So this is a region where it doesn't seem so good for long-term future, given mm-hmm. that things are going to be getting hotter and drier, but it was a good place to get stuck for this particular crisis, you know? Right. And like I said, it's my best friend about the property, so he's not charging me rent to be here, you know what I mean? So Right, and it, and it's funny because it sounds like both of us are sort of what the buzzwords this year, which which are anarchist terms, which I love that that has come out. We're both in kind of mutual aid situations. Yes, yeah, and um, I think we're seeing more of that, and and some of some of it that's being called mutual aid is actually charity. But I think we need, like, as a culture, to explore mutual aid and to explore these unconventional um, living circumstances as we try to combat all our our social and environmental collapse is going to be so important. Absolutely, and the people who already own land now are going to find themselves in a position of like, well, they're going to need to share it with people who don't, you know, right. and they're going to, need to share these resources. And so there's going to be interesting to see how that goes. Some people are going mm-hmm. to be generous with what they have. Other people are going to try to take advantage, you know, but now, all this now is getting into sort of thinking about what will happen next. And I think that's an interesting mm-hmm. conversation mm-hmm. too, but I, I do want to maybe cover 2020. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's one thing I wanted to say. It's interesting because you had like a specific premonition last summer. And uh, unfortunately, I was up in Northern California leaving as of last summer and we missed each other. And that's just that's so sad that that happened. Yeah, it's it was too kind bad. of a crazy time for me. But um, I, I c- can't say I had a premonition of what's happening this year because my my 2019 was kind of a mess. And um, well, kind of it was terrible. but. Um, I I do know that most people, I think, who have been cognizant of what's going on in society and what's going on in in the environment have um, kind of foretold this kind of collapse and this kind of pandemic. I know a friend of mine who is a close enough friend that I can rant about all things, even if he might not agree with everything I say. When this whole thing happened, he, he wrote to me, and I, I'm patting myself on the back a little, but he wrote and he said, Mattis, you called it. Because it was, you know, for any of us, it's so clear that this, this kind of social unrest and public health and environmental upheaval was bound to happen sooner rather than later, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Even if I had not had that sort of premonition, I would not have been, you know, surprised in right. to a degree because I've been looking at these things for years, seeing how right. our society has been going, the trajectory of it, how resource depletion has been going on, all of these things, and also mm-hmm. just having a knowledge of history and being mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, empires fall, like every single one has so far. Right, right. And the growing inequality and the hoarding of resources and the hoarding of wealth and, you know, yeah, all of it, it was bound to happen. It's just, it's, it's very weird that, you know, all this stuff that we probably thought would happen is actually happening. Right. And one thing that you put on our list here that I really liked was you put worst year, question mark, for whom? Well, I hear the people who've had stability and comfort talking about it being a worst year. And most of them still have a, a, a good amount of stability and comfort. And what I, when I hear, you know, the people who've lost everything, who are going to the food banks, who are on the brink of homelessness or homeless, I'm not hearing them say it's the worst year because many of them have had many wor- terrible years in the past and can foresee terrible years in the future. So it, it's really the people who've... Um, undergone this kind of inconvenience that so many others have had for most of their lives who who are saying it's the worst year. But I think we would do well to look at all the people who've been suffering before and are going to be suffering so much more in the future. And they're not the ones who are saying it's the worst year because this is just, um, you know, par for the course for them, unfortunately. Yeah, it's it's another year. Yeah, yeah. Another very, very bad year. Yep. Yeah. I've also picked up on that in the sentiment that it has been 
maybe a class of people who has never been very inconvenienced, who are now mm-hmm. being inconvenienced for the first time, and that inconvenienced is actually maybe one of the best words to use to describe it. Yeah, yeah. And and I think, I mean, the thing about that is, I think there could be a lot of growth and a lot of learning from it. But when you hear people saying, oh, we just want to get back to normal, that's very discouraging to me, because as we all know, and has been the cliche, normal was the problem. And to get back to this convenient way of life is not where we need to be going in the future if we are to, um, you know, to quell some of this social unrest and to grow a more egalitarian and and stable, well, I don't know if stable is the right word, but a society where people's needs are met and a society where we're not destroying the environment to meet people's needs. Right. So. Right. There, there's de- there's bound to be some inconvenience, and I think anybody who's fighting for these kinds of things, these kinds of um, social justice and environmental justice uh, issues, never has um, a life of inconvenience because you can't when you're working toward these sorts of um, these sorts of goals. Right. Right. And and speaking of the unrest, I have felt from the beginning that the social upheavals that we experienced this year and the uprisings, especially the extended uh, ones that happened in places mm-hmm. like Portland, were really mm-hmm. a great thing that happened this year. Oh, absolutely. And it's funny because um, it makes me think of when um, we had our uprising. I was a grad student in Wisconsin when um, we had our Wisconsin uprising against the the bill that the the um, governor put forth, you know, basically doing away with uh, public sector unions or trying to do away with public sector unions. And, um, you know, that was a great bit of upheaval. We occupied the Capitol building. We created, um, you know, a whole community there where we stayed for several weeks, if not a couple months on end. And, um, and the, it was, it was the most, I mean, I was kind of joyous in that time and because I, I thought it was a long time coming and it was a wonderful thing to witness and it was something that we all needed to do and this is what we need to do more of. And I think that's what was happening with the Black Lives Matter protests. It was, it was such a long time coming, you know, since the 60s. Um, I, all I, the only thing I can think about that was equivalent for different um, issues was the WTO protests in Seattle in 1999. Um, but since then, there's been, you know, no good activism on all of these issues that have been just simmering under the surface. And so it was just, it was wonderful to behold. And yeah, and it, more is needed, although it the, what happened in Wisconsin was the whole thing was basically quashed for... Um, partisan politics and for, you know, elections. And we need to, and I realized that that wasn't going to do anything and it didn't. And, you know, basically our whole uprising was a failure and the Black Lives Matter um, protest has, has much more interesting demands of defunding the police. And I hope that, you know, it will still continue to go on and we can still explore these demands and not just rely on public officials and rely on um, electoral politics to meet these demands. Right. And I feel also as though that movement is not over either. I feel like there's just kind of a pause button that got hit on that one, in part because everything pauses for the elections and in part because the wintertime definitely just tends to be a time when these outdoor movements simmer down because it's just more uncomfortable to be out there. You know, I guess I'm hoping that it'll come back again in the spring when the weather warms up again. Yeah, I sure hope so. And I hope people are, you know, still working in their communities um, to make some of these changes. Right. And definitely there's been places where people have been working on this from the ground up already. And then when this uprising came, they threw in with it and they're continuing mm-hmm. their work anyway. Mm-hmm. One of my earlier podcasts was with an organizer named Robin Wansley from Minneapolis. And, mm-hmm. you know, in that podcast episode, she told the story of how the attempt 
to defund the police through the city council in Minneapolis, how that whole thing got shut down uh, mm -hmm. because they have, it's strange, it's an unelected body which looks at anything that would be making a change to the Constitution. And when the city council suggested this defund the police thing, they put it in terms of something that would need to change the Constitution. And, of course, what that meant is that now had to go to before this unelected body of people who are not reflective of the demographics of the city in age or, or race or gender or anything else. And of course, they just shut it down right away, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it was like, oh, hmm, the city council knew it was going to go there. And, and then it kind of made the whole thing look like the city council was just doing a... um like a bait and switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was just performative, you know, to begin mm -hmm. with, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so it was really fascinating to get that whole story about that from Robin, who is now running for city council in Minneapolis actually next year. So I'm hoping to have her on again to talk about that. Oh, great. Yeah. But, you know, I also listen to the Black Agenda Radio podcast on a, a regular basis. Right. And the discussion uh -huh. there was all around not going for defund the police, but going for community control of the police. And so they were making a distinction there and saying, no, this is what we want to do. It's not just about taking money away or moving money around, but about the community having control of the money and making these decisions and deciding what they're going to be, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I was watching, um, I think I saw a small clip from Syracuse, New York, talking about, um, I think it was a, a city council meeting, and they were talking about how you know, there's a great percentage of people of color, particularly black people in Syracuse, um, a decent percentage, but the police, I think are mostly white, but beyond that, they're not even from the city. They all live in, you know, from the outskirts of town. So the, the whole city is funding these people who, who do not live in the city and they're paying for these people to support economies and to, um, you know, live outside their jurisdiction yet, you know, patrol in this city where they are not patrolling and they're not helping their own people. And as we know, you know, a lot of what the police do is not protecting and serving as they should do. But it, regardless, if it maybe if they lived in the place where they were to um, work, there would be more of protecting the actual citizens, because it would be, you know, their own, their own community. Yeah, that's been an issue for years. You right. Know, absolutely, too. And and the fact that the police have been able to live outside of their communities for years has also been going on. Like Back in 1991, I was actually living in East St. Paul, which is a far-flung <laughs> suburb of St. Paul, Minnesota, in the Twin Cities. And I was working at, it was the first mm -hmm. job I had after college. I was working at a Food and Fuel, which is a convenience store gas station chain there. And one of the funnest jobs mm -hmm. I've ever had, actually. And I, uh, and I was good friends with my, um, manager and we'd go to parties. And we mm -hmm. went to this party, uh, in the neighborhood that was at this guy's house. And the guy there was a St. Paul cop. And everybody's drinking beers and, and this and that. And he like brings out one of his, uh, rifles and he's like, Oh, hey, have you ever, have you ever held a rifle? I'm like, no, I haven't. And he goes, here, hold this. I'm like, okay. And you know, I, I'm, I'm in this guy's kitchen and he's kind of an intimidating person. So, okay, I'll just, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll just, I'll, sure, I'll hold it, you know, <laughs> right? So I, I take the rifle and, and he goes, here, and here's how you want to hold it, you know, put it up. Okay. okay, now aim it over there. And he points at a uh, coffee maker on the counter. Now pretend that's an, and then he said N word. Oh, God. Right? Jeez. You know, and so yeah. it's like, wow, I've always remembered that because I'm yeah. like, well, you know, he wasn't the only one, right? Right. You know, like, <laughs> and I like, kind of, I had a feeling that's where the story is going, unfortunately, <laughs> but it's, it's all too predictable, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was 1991, right? Yeah. Of course, if you get into the history of policing, you find out that, oh, well, some of them came out of the whole slave patrol tradition yeah. and, you know, KKK, they were in it. They still are. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's, it's never been, the institution that we say it is. And so, yeah, that's, I think, why the call for community control, because if we just, to say, abolish the police and change nothing else in society, then what would happen is that the rich people would just make their own private police force. There would, right. would be even less accountable right. than the one we have now. 
One thing I want to bring up is I was thinking about the, when we were having this Wisconsin uprising in 2011, and we did occupy the Capitol building, and we were all essentially living there for weeks on end. Um, you know, it, it really showed that the police are not necessary if you have mutual aid and support, because we were really living, it was, it was anarchism at work, and it was a whole bunch of people, like, sleeping and and living in this Capitol building. And there was food brought in. People organized their own public safety group. They organized the food service. They organized um, um, emergency health services. Everything was sort of self-organized. And there was you know, no violence. There was no theft. People were sitting in their Capitol building and they'd put down their laptops and they'd go for a walk or go to another room or go do something else. Nothing was stolen. I mean, it was just incredible. And it was an incredible showing of how, and I think Occupy in New York was much like this. The police are not necessary. What's necessary is mutual support and respect and understanding. And when people's needs are served and when people feel like they're doing something that benefits themselves and everyone around them, you're, you're not going to have this antagonistic kind of society. And so you don't need people to be policing everything. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. So, yeah. uh, so and- I mean, along with community control, we need community services. We need people to not be in such dire need and such dire straits. And instead of working toward that, especially during this pandemic, we see most of our public officials, especially at the federal level, doing the exact opposite. Right, right. And I think that during 2020, that some of these concepts that had been familiar to us as activists from the experiences that we've had around the fringes, I think that more people started to see some of these things in part as the, the, the Black Lives Movement uh, protests got larger and just in part because of the general suffering that was going on. Absolutely. And, you know, that that's the sad thing. It, it takes people to have their own suffering or have their own adversity to finally see this and finally be... Um, open and responsive to these kinds of ideas and thoughts that are on the fringes, as you said. Right, right. And so I I, I saw some of that going on this year, and I I felt hopeful. So Mm -hmm. I was looking at this, and I'm like, well, no, this isn't, I don't, objectively speaking, I don't think this is the worst year ever, because I'm seeing some positive things happening, too, that have been a long time coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's just... I, I don't know. For me, I I looked at that and, you know, at the beginning of the year, I talked to some people and I was on some podcasts where we talked about how, yeah, the Black Lives Matter movement was so hopeful. And, um, you know, all of this, um, this awakening for so many people was so hopeful. But as the as the year ends, I'm not feeling that so much anymore. And maybe it's because of where I am. I'm in an area where People are around me seem to be very traditional in their values and their way of life. And so um, they're very stuck in the Puritan work ethic and in, um, um, you know, you know, Christmas traditions and all of these other kind of what I would deem as frivolous traditions that we can't continue that involve so much consumerism and so much exploitation of other people in the environment. And I see a lot of people here just wanting to go back to that and wanting life to go back to normal and wanting everything to be, as you, as you said in your wonderful piece, the end of stability, um, wanting things to be stable for them again. And that, that really saddens me. Um, and the other thing I see is that, and I guess maybe this is because I'm exposed to more sort of conventional mainstream media than I had been in say the previous 15 years or so, because I, I have a television at my disposal now and I'm seeing news. Um, I, uh, while I see the news talking about how many people are falling into hard times and will be evicted or are evicted and are going to food banks because they don't have enough food. I, I just see this. It's, it's actually a term that a lot of people kind of in our fringe circles know called um, perseverance porn. So they they focus on, you know, 
individuals or individual nonprofits who are helping these people, but they don't focus on the systemic issues and the root causes of all of this. And they don't talk about how much we need to change in society and, you know, the, the tremendous inequality that's been going on for the past, you know, that's been exacerbated and going on for the past 40 years and how returning to normal is only going to exacerbate this inequality issue and people aren't going to get better. So for me, I'm, I'm feeling a little less hopeful than maybe I did at the beginning of the year. I haven't heard this term perseverance porn, by the way, but I immediately oh. know what you meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I yeah. first heard it from um, the group uh, FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. Oh, they're great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it, it, this is really interesting because, like I said, I hadn't had a TV in years and I hadn't watched, you know, the nightly news or whatever. But at the end of every broadcast on all of the national news, um, the, the three big programs, CBS, NBC, ABC, and I, I think they even do this on the local news, they have a human interest story that often involves someone in trouble, whether economic or something, and always involves like a hero coming to the rescue, whether that hero be um, a rich person or um, a a, a certain service like a nonprofit that's feeding the homeless. Um, and of course, these are great things that, you know, people are doing for others. But the implication is that that we can fix things one at a time, and that it's not a problem that we have these rich people who are multimillionaires and multibillionaires while others are homeless, and that 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 their being multimillionaires and multibillionaires isn't a problem and part of the exact problem that creates the homelessness and creates the poverty in others. You know? Right. right. Yeah, well, the, the media in this country is really just notorious for not being able to go anywhere near a systemic uh, analysis. And part of it is that because the people in the media are these exact people. <laughs> you know, yeah, oh, um, definitely. Treating the, the systemic issues we have would involve a big change in their, um, their compensation and their role in society and, and their, their careers and their jobs. So, Right, right. Yeah, because at some point, the media became, I guess you could say, professionalized in the last 20 or 30 years in a way that they hadn't been before. And so a lot of them really joined the limousine liberal class. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, the media, I felt, you know, over the course of 2020, I did not see an improvement in terms of the fact that more and more of what we mean by media is social media. There was more stories this year where here's these social media giants that are shutting down these accounts for such and such a reason. And here's this thing that's being censored. And here's these algorithms that are being tightened up. And the power of social media is, is growing. And as it grows, they're constricting a hold on what they're allowing to go through. You know, they're yeah. putting a more of a, a finer and finer filter on what they're allowing us to see at this point. And it's done in this subtle way where you don't even realize what's being taken away from you, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was you know, a lot of instances of this stuff this year, but the one that kind of stood out for me was when the New York Post uh, put out an article shortly before the presidential election about Biden's son, Hunter, and something yes. about, I mean, I don't know the details of the story, and Twitter and Facebook basically wouldn't allow anyone to share or see this story, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like, now, wait a minute, they're not the National Enquirer, you know? And I mean, you know what? The National Enquirer, uh, you know, all of these places, they, they do things for the wrong reason. But I, I mean, the Post is thought of as a tabloid almost as bad as the National Enquirer. But, you know, that doesn't mean once in a while something doesn't seep through that's actual truth. And yeah, well, and they've been around for like a hundred years or something like that. I mean, it's not like a fly by night thing that just came along, you know, like mm -hmm. I thought it was a chilling moment to see them censored like that for what was a very obviously partisan reason, mm -hmm. you know, too, because if they'd been in the exact same story in one of Donald Trump's kids, well, of course they wouldn't have done that, you know? Yep. And um, by the same token, the whole Tara Reid um, story of her 
being sexually assaulted by Biden. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about censorship. Yeah, because she did an interview with uh, Katie Halpert in the spring. Right. Who I, I appreciate a lot of Katie's work for sure. And there was like a little bit of, of news about her and then it just disappeared. I mean, yeah, I guess that's oh, she, something really... Uh, I guess Tara Reid was... I mean, the story was quashed, but she has really suffered tremendously for speaking out, which is why so oh, many sure. women don't speak out about these things. But, you know, the whole Me Too movement who said every woman, we believe we are, believe every woman, they would not support her. I mean, it's just... It's actually super disgraceful when you think about how contrived all of this is and how it's so partisan. Um, it is... Yeah. And then, then this, the, just the idea of the censorship, as so many people say, when they censored, um, wh who was it? Um, Alex uh, Jones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they'll start with someone who's so obviously horrible, like him, that everybody agrees, yeah, that's great to be censored. But they do that to sort of start making little cracks so that they can censor anything that they don't want to hear which means all of the leftists who are always censored anyway are going to be completely shut out because their voices, I think part of the problem is that some of this, this left, these left voices, I mean, you, you know, because we grew up when there was no internet and we didn't really have a voice. I know, I remember hearing you say you started with indie media, like in the late nineties, early two thousands. And, um, but it was, it's very hard to have a voice on the left. And now left voices are coming through a little on Twitter and in various YouTube, various other places, and they've got to find a way to get those shut down. And this censorship is a good way. Let's start with Alex Jones and then we'll keep going after, and it'll just seem normal that this is being done. Yeah, absolutely. No, it normalizes it. And yeah. They're just priming the pump basically exactly. when they, when they do those things. And, you know, I mean, and then just to see, the media, you know, the mainstream media line up behind uh, Biden, like just as sort of this wall, like immediately their bias was really just just naked, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know, I'm, I'm certainly no no fan of Trump. And, you know, I dislike him for reasons that most liberals don't in that I was, you know, most upset about the things he was doing to the environment, which didn't really seem to matter to most of the liberals or the Democrats over the last four years because they didn't pay attention, you know. Mm -hmm. So I wanted the man out for that reason, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, looking at how the mainstream media was lining up for Biden and against him, I was just like, well, yeah, if Fox and these people want to talk about, or, or Trump himself want to talk about how this media is against him, well, well, they are. Yeah. I mean, oh, they just really obviously are. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm from New York. I remember Trump as a, as a preteen and teenager when he was only, uh, you know, really known within certain circles and within this region, I guess, before like The Apprentice. And I, I've detested him and seen what a morally corrupt and you know, horrendous person he's been <laughs> for his whole life. And, um, but, you know, it, uh, and now that, like I said, that I'm seeing the mainstream media, it's so clear how they're aligned against him. Everything is his fault. I, I mean, when it comes to the environment, he, yeah, he's horrendous, but the horror started way before him and continued throughout all of these democratic, um, these democratic administrations and through, Democrats running the House and or the Senate, you know, and to put it all on him, there's there's never been probably a president in our lifetimes who's been so psychopathic. But that doesn't mean that all of our ills have come from him and emanated from him. Talking about the elections and what happened with the Democratic Party, we had Biden, who was pretty much the anointed one who started out horribly and, you know, no one was interested in him, at least the voters. He was losing everywhere. Um, the other person that the Democratic Party seemed to want was Kamala Harris. And same thing with her. No one, none of the citizens seemed to have wanted her. Um, we had this whole thing where Bernie was the one who was ahead. but. In Iowa, the caucuses 
were the caucuses, I don't know if themselves were rigged, but the reporting of them was rigged, as we know now for sure, through the Democratic Party. And so Pete Buttigieg all of a sudden claims that he's the victor, which he actually wasn't, but it gave him a big boost. But throughout the Democratic um, primaries, everything was orchestrated to come down so Bernie would lose his seat where the citizens wanted Bernie, but other people didn't. The, the people in charge of the Democratic Party didn't, obviously. And they, they pretty much orchestrated anointing Biden and Kamala Harris, the two people who, at the beginning of the primaries, no one seemed to have wanted. Um, and it was due in a large part to the entire Democratic National Committee, but also in a large part due to orchestrations from Barack Obama. Right. And so we ended up with these people that aren't representative of what anyone in this country wanted. And, and we're supposed to support that instead of supporting Trump. And of course, we're not going to support Trump. So this is what we're left with. And we pretend we have a democracy and we pretend we have freedom. We have complete orchestration by the powers that be. And our votes really mean they meant getting out this psychopath and replacing him with the same people that we always have the status quo, which has caused all, everything that we're experiencing right now. Yeah, and it would be really difficult to find a, a candidate more status quo than Joe Biden, you know, who yeah. has has been in Washington since I believe 1972. So for most of our lives, right, yeah, you know, that's, that's and my whole life, yeah, <laughs> right, right. I was born in 69. So yeah, I was three when he went to DC for the first time. And, you know, he was one of the founders of the Democratic Leadership Council mm -hmm. with Al Gore and Bill Clinton in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So he was one of the people who was there leading this charge to turn the Democrats away from the, the New Deal coalition and instead to become the, the corporate monster that they are at this the, point, you know? Yeah, the third way, as they call it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just complete bullshit, you know? Yeah. And, and, yeah, and, and, you know, of course, he was in favor of the Patriot Act. In fact, he, had, he was one of the people who helped author that, right? I'm not sure about that, but we, we do know he was an author of the crime, the, you know, notorious Definitely. crime bill and so many other horrific, um, you know, bills that he was part of and happy to sponsor or sign, you know? Right, right. I mean, Jim Crow Joe is one of yeah. his, you know, nicknames because he worked with the segregationists before he made public remarks before about not wanting his kids to go to, to integrated schools, right. you know, because of the, the, the quote jungle environment. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the man is just totally heinous. He really is nothing other than not Trump. And mm -hmm. it's just, I don't know. I, the, the, I was following the uh, election results, you know, listening to podcasts and listening to the news. And so I was just, and I remember on Saturday when it was finally clear that he was going to be declared the winner, that Biden was going to be declared the winner. I was like, okay, so he's in, Trump's out. Where's this going to put us in four years? And I just kind of opened my mind to be like, well, where's this going to go? And I just mm -hmm. had the deepest sense of foreboding settle yeah. down on me. And I'm like, oh man, this is going to, this is, this is, I mean, there was no good outcome possible from this election, mm -hmm. but like, I have no doubt at all that this particular outcome is taking us to uh, a, a darker place. Well, you know, the, first of a all, a darker place. I want to say a darker place than we are now, you know, and and had yeah. Trump gone back in again. Well, yes, we would also be in a darker place yeah. than we are now four years. I yeah. think that that was inevitable. But like, definitely, this is going to take us to another place. And, and I'm afraid that what I think is that probably Biden won't make it through the next four years, uh, you know? I, I yeah, I, I don't want to sound morose or, you know, uh, but yeah, I don't think he's going to make it either. No, he's not in very good health. And I think, you know, maybe at some point he just decides, okay, I'm going to step down because I'm not in very good health. And then the, the United States will get the big PR win of, of having, you know, its mm -hmm. first black female president. But the thing is, is that I think that the, the chances of Kamala Harris being reelected are probably close to or less than zero. I well, don't she, think the United no States will do her. that. No one voted for her in the primaries. And she was the darling of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, gosh, there's so much to say about this. I mean, besides just the obvious um, 
policy factors with Joe Biden. And um, it, like you said, I think dark days are ahead and it would be obvious. The thing is, it would be obvious with Trump that, you know, this foreboding. But the problem with Biden and Harris is you put in this diverse cabinet and everybody this everybody likes the superficiality and thinks it's meaningful. You know, does it matter if we're in all of these wars and we're dropping bombs on other countries when it's a, you know, we've, we've got a black head of national defense instead of a white guy? Does, is that better? You know, it's it's just... It's all tokenism and superficiality, and it's it's insane that we think this is okay, and that you know it, it it actually makes it okay, and that's what we saw during Obama's presidency. We saw that a bit during Clinton's presidency too. It's the these superficial tokens that make the same old status quo seem okay, and in some ways, that's why it's. It's for people like us who are paying attention, it's harder than being under a Trump administration because what he does is so glaringly obvious. But, you know, they try to make it not obvious when the same thing is happening under Biden. And, you know, we also know Biden said to his donor class that nothing will fundamentally change. And he meant that. And that's what that's what. Everybody who's feeling uncomfortable now and never dis- experienced that discomfort before wants nothing will fundamentally change. And as we know, in order for a society to um, to remain and not completely collapse, in order for our ecosystem, our global ecosystem, to remain and not collapse, everything needs to fundamentally change. So yeah, it is. It is sort of it's very foreboding that this time. Yeah, definitely. I, I I agree that that people will be people who have a compassionate side to them, or who want to care, or whatever, will now feel licensed not to do so. You know, because Trump is out there. So so I I hear you totally. That like there's the well, it's more obvious with Trump part, mm-hmm. right? So I, I hear that, and at the same time, I'm like, wow, but. This particular runaround of getting a Republican with a Democrat, there were there were things that didn't come back. Like when when Trump first came in, I thought, well, at least we'll get an anti-war movement back now, won't we? And then we didn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I thought, well, now maybe people will pay more attention to the environment, but then they didn't. And so it's mm-hmm. like it's like Obama killed the anti-war movement and killed the environmental movement, although that might have been Clinton who did that. And mm-hmm. then and then. You know, we didn't get either of them back with Trump. And all we heard about for four years, I mean, not all, but 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 what dominated was this Russia, Russia, Russia bullshit. Right. Yeah. That was never proven. Right. It was never proven. There was never anything to it. The reason they're not talking about it now is because it served its purpose as a headline grabber. That's all it was ever intended to be. And, you know, the, the, the terrible things that were happening to the environment you know, that, that, that escalated under Trump really did not get enough attention, you right. know, right. they really didn't get enough attention. And then once you get into the, and so, and so, so that's really why I have a sense of foreboding too. Cause it's like, wow, well, if that's what obvious under the bad guy means, oh, geez, I like, know. Yeah. You know, if it's going to be even worse than that, because already these things were getting far less attention than they deserved. And in terms of the environment, what what strikes me is that, first of all, everything has become about climate change or climate, the climate crisis now. And so um, the really climate change is a symptom of our entire ecological dysfunction. I was talking to someone else this weekend about that term that I've been trying to use, but I think that, and so other other people, I guess, have used it too, and I think that encompasses everything. We have a dysfunctional global ecosystem and climate change is just a symptom. So when we're looking at just tackling that symptom, nothing is going to get better. And so I think there is there is more consciousness, but people are looking at that um in a myopic way. And so we're not going to really make any headway as long as we look at it in that, in that realm, that it's just climate chaos. Um, But beyond that, 
th- there's so much of these superficial measures being done um, that are not solutions in any way and sometimes exacerbate our climate problem or our, sorry, see, I am even saying it, our <laughs> ecological and environmental problems, even when we think they're something that's good. And um, a lot of these big organizations that work for the environment or, or a lot of these big voices that speak about the environment, they're so quick to say, look at this victory or look at this great thing that's being done when it's really not so great and it's really a minimal victory or it's a minimal type of reform. And I just think you can't keep, it's like they're, I don't know, they feel like by by cheering on these small things, we'll get more done. And it, it, that doesn't happen. You can't cheer on the small things. You have to go for, you know, go for broke, go for these huge things because you're not going to ever get the huge changes, but at least you won't be starting small and doing basically nothing. Right, right. Have, have you ever read uh, any John Michael Greer? No. Oh, yes. Actually, wait. No, I'm not. He used, to, not. He used, to, do a, he used to do a blog called The Arch, the Arch Druid Report. No, I don't think I have read him. You'd really enjoy him. He has a, a website now called Ecosophia, Sophia okay. as in wisdom dot yeah. net. And and he, he talked he, he's he's both an environmentalist and very politically astute and an actual druid. Like he was an actual mm-hmm. arch druid pagan for a number of years. He's put out and he also writes like uh science fiction books and stuff. He's he's fascinating. I think you'd probably really enjoy him. Uh so Ecosophia dot net. But he, yeah, he talked about what you're talking about. He said that we need to think big. We need to have, we need to dream big. We need to put really big visions out there. That's where we need to start. You know, yeah. not, not starting from a place of compromise or, or starting from around the edge of like, no, here's what we need to see. You know, we need to see, you know, for example, an end to capitalism. You know, we need to see an end to conspicuous consumption. We need to see an end to, you know, we, we, we need to like, paint this picture of everything that needs to happen. You know, we need to see agriculture that no longer depends on, on chemical pesticides and chemical right. fertilizers, you right. know, like we need to say all those things. And, and that's where we have to start. And we're not starting there anymore. And so this was a criticism that he was having of the left. And I believe of environmentalists in, in particular, because that's actually how you can get people on board and inspire people is by putting out the, the big picture like that. You know? Right. And, and, you know, I think in politics, people are talking about how incrementalism doesn't work for various social issues, but they're not talking about it in terms of the environment. And it really, I hate to see all these little congratulatory things about, um, you know, just some small measure. Oh, we're, you know, we're banning this particular chemical that that Europe has banned, you know, for the past two decades or something, you know, it's and then they congratulate the the people who've done that. And it's like, this is this is not even close to the, the realm where we need to be at this point. And we shouldn't be congratulating these tiny little victories, because they really do amount to nothing. We need to be thinking so much bigger. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, when, you know, all of politics is put in terms of, you know, presidential politics and electoral politics and all that, that's all, that's all the opposite of thinking big. And, you know, I wanted to say something in that realm. I I remember years ago, you wrote a great piece on um, Christmas and Christmas trees and how ecologically destructive that was. And I was thinking this year in the middle of a pandemic, this is another thing that you know, has gotten me kind of down. Uh, you know, you, we, we have this consciousness about climate change more than ever. I don't think it's a full environmental consciousness, but it's something that people are more aware of. And yet, when I look around, and you, you probably didn't see this where you are, but I live in a very populated area now with, like I said, a lot of very traditional people. And and most of them actually would they would be, you know, the typical liberal Democrats um, who probably voted for Biden. And they so they they're aware of climate change, but they can't connect them putting up all of these frivolous 
Christmas decorations that waste all of this energy and chopping down all of these trees, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions, I can't remember what the number is every year that become mulch and, and are grown on um, monoculture tree farms, all of it totally unsustainable. I mean, in a year of a pandemic, they can't even give up this stuff. On the contrary, it's thought of as, as hopeful and something for us to do to feel better about living through this pandemic. And that, I have to say, has gotten me really down, um, thinking that we can't connect these simple dots. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Like, it's just this, there's a sense of like, um, self entitlement, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's these frivolous and superficial things to make people feel at ease for a short moment, but that are actually really harmful to all of us in the long term. And we, we just, I don't know how we're ever going to get around this kind of mindset and reframe these sorts of things. And, and you know, just me kind of saying this, I, I'm always the Debbie Downer, as they say, of, of the group when I talk to people who, who, you know, don't quite think like me and don't think about this kind of stuff all the time. And sometimes I just have to bring it up. And, and it's kind of like, we don't want to hear that. And, yeah. you know, whether it's true or not, and a lot of the and a lot of people can see that it's truth, but we just we just want our Christmas lights this year, you know, and yeah, I just don't know how we get around this kind of mindset. And a lot of it is it's just because of our collective brainwashing and our our need to feel like part of the group, I think. Right, right. Well, there's a there's a. I think there's a lot of urges or motivations that we have as humans that are just twisted, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but by, by the market, you know, mm -hmm. and so, and so, well, of course, you know, we want to, 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 to have celebrations, you know, of course, I mean, all those things are real, you know, and as you know, living in the North and I've lived in, in, you know, this is the farthest South I've, I've lived in, I don't probably ever actually. Um, but you know, I spent many years in the North and the day is getting longer. Hell yeah. That's something to celebrate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's definitely, and people have been celebrating a holiday, you know, at the winter time, you know, for, for, for many thousands of years, you know, for that reason. But yeah, how is it that that can happen in a way that like it isn't just about consuming and isn't just about destruction and isn't just about selfishness because that is. Right all that it is about, right. you know, right. at this of, point. Uh, and of course, celebrations and joy and hope are, you know, so important. But we've, we've kind of twisted these things into something that's always about markets and capitalism and consumerism. And we don't realize that it's actually very destructive to our lives, to our society, to our ecosystem, to our public health, even. I mean, this pandemic is because of our way of life in many, many respects. And yeah, we all want to celebrate. We all want, you know, joy. We all want community, but we have to envision new ways of doing it if we're going to survive. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, you brought up the pandemic. Let's, let's talk about the pandemic. I have a lot of acquaintances and friends, and some of them are friends in real life who have had a lot of skepticism about mm -hmm. about the, the the pandemic to various degrees. Some just don't trust, you know, what the what the government's going to say about this or that. You know, some believe that it doesn't exist. You know, I mean, there's there's mm -hmm. a spectrum out there, you yeah. know, and I don't want to just, you know, say denialism or anything like that, because I think that in the culture that we're in in the United States right now, basically from left to right, from educated to uneducated, whatever scale you want to put that, that put there, mm -hmm. like basically everybody is deluded about something, 
You know, yeah, like yeah. they are. Mm-hmm. There's like delusions everywhere. There's very few people who are clear thinking. And a lot of times you can find people who are clear thinking on one set of issues, but not on another or something like yep. that. Right. So yep. I don't want to just say, oh, this group of people that thinks this is just completely full of shit because, well, they might not be about other topics or whatever, you know. Yeah, However, we all have our blind spots. Yeah. Sure. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, all that being said, I would want to kind of look at the at, at, at the pandemic like, you know, with all that in mind, too, because I also believe that, for example, there's people who have an overconfidence and an overtrust in the pharmaceutical, you know, yes. industry in the, yes. in the United States and mm-hmm. who, who aren't aware of how much the regulatory agencies of the United States are, you know, in bed with the industries that they're trying yep. to. I mean, See, all of these are are, the, are these are issues, right? I don't know. Just jump in there wherever you want. Well, <laughs> in a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... You know, I've, I've heard you, um, I've read some of your work and heard podcasts you talking about this sort of, yeah, I don't want to call it denialism, but, you know, some people who aren't as worried about this pandemic as others. And um, I've experienced that with some of my friends, too. And I think You know, there's so many aspects of it. I think part of it is because so many people are ending up suffering economically from this. And of of course, that economic suffering need not be. Our government has enough money. Um, It can create money anytime it wants, as it always does for the things it wants to create money for, for the wealthy, for the military, for corporations, and it could create that money or t- and or tax the wealthy to provide a basic income for everyone. So no one needs to be suffering. All of the suffering is completely avoidable and needless, and that makes me so angry. And I'm like yeah. screaming at the at the the news that I'm forced to watch every day because it's just infuriating to pretend that this is okay and that this is the only way it could be. You yeah. know. Um, the the first stim, quote unquote stimulus we we saved the fucking cruise industry excuse me <laughs> yeah. but you know the cruise industry should not be saved it's an environmental nightmare it's just horrendous and it should be something that goes away aviation is an environmental nightmare and we shouldn't be bailing out that industry we we should be giving money to people that's all we need to do really but beyond that um so I know some friends who are having trouble because they're saying people are hurting more than the pandemic would hurt them. And in many ways, that's true. And it's because of our government. It's because of our society. Um, and then, you know, there's other people who are saying, well, the 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 um, the death rate isn't very high. And, you know, so is it is it really as bad as we think it is? Um you know, the problem is it's a brand new, it's, it may not have a hugely high death rate, but it's hugely contagious. It's even more contagious now that they have this new variant that, that, that they're saying is in London and came from London. You know, it's all over the world by now because of our global society. So, and we don't, as, as much as we know that it affects, you know, people with underlying issues and people who are of a certain age more than others, we are seeing all people of all ages being affected. There was actually something that was going on here in New York um, at the beginning where they were seeing some children having um, these issues that did not resemble how it it wasn't respiratory. It, it, um, Oh my gosh. And I'm even forgetting exactly their symptoms, but it was a terrible um, ailment found in children and only children. And I haven't heard it talked about, but it was, it was really horrible. And, and we really don't know all of the organ systems in our body that COVID is, is affecting. It seems to really be affecting the cardiovascular system. Uh, there was a um, pathologist here in New York who was saying in every COVID patient she did an autopsy on, there was all of this heart damage. There's evidence that to show that it may be affecting our neurology and people 
neurological damage and long-term neurological damage. Um, so, I mean, we really don't know how bad this virus is. And um, so, of course, we should be trying to, and I guess, yeah. So, I mean, I'm with you in that we should be doing everything we can to be socially distancing, wearing masks, um, avoiding anything that we don't need to do, avoiding all of this frivolous stuff that we um, that we, you know, think is that necessary for part of our lives. And of course, then there's people who can't do that because they can't survive and they can't have a roof over their heads and food to eat if they are going to, um, you know, they can't stay home, basically. So there's that, too. I mean, I've been very precautionary principle about it myself, where yes, I'm like, yes. well, I'm like, do we know that it's this or that? Because I mean, obviously, there's things we don't know because it's such a new thing. But it's like, right. yeah, but I, I feel like I'm going to not take the risk because I don't know. And right. plus, the rest of the world is taking this very seriously. You know, mm -hmm. and they're not as stupid as we are in a lot of ways. They're not as selfish right. in a lot of ways. I mean, like, there are right. real scientists in other countries, you know? Like, if this was just the mm -hmm. United States, I, I, maybe I would look at the issue a little bit differently than I am. But it's like, yeah. no, no, I'm, I'm looking around at the world and I'm like seeing that, no, everyone else is taking this seriously. You know? Yes. They, they know this yes. is a real thing. Here's the things that they're doing. Okay. Well, yes. we're just really standing out as being fucking idiots here, you know? And, 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 and I'm really talking from in a policy terms when I'm, when I'm saying that, like our, our government mm -hmm. has just been really fucking idiotic about this, you know? Right. And, and it was going to be hard no matter who was president, you know, because we have this system of 50 different states with 50 different governments, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, my friend Ali Valkyrie, who I had on the podcast a couple times, yep. once talking about COVID, yeah, yep. from France, right? You know, she mm -hmm. talked about this. She's like, well, it's not like there wouldn't have been a trouble if Hillary was in there because you have a confederacy. And it's true. Right. And, and it's very easy to imagine the situation where Hillary would have been saying, oh, we need to do this. We need to do this. And then you could see Republican governors coming out and saying, no, we're not going to do that. I mean, right. you know, things would have been it would have been a very divisive four years no matter who was put in place. It just would have been because so many people just hated her, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. and so like, I'm not, I don't, I don't buy that one that this was all Trump's fault either. Yeah. Part of it is that we have a system in which we were going to be in trouble because it's, 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 um, it's very difficult to have a centralized, federalized approach here due to our system of government, you know? And of right. course, that's one reason to just start hating on China because they're all authoritarian and blah, blah, blah. And I just, you know, all the hating on China thing that's come out of this has been terrible, you know, too. And that's been serving, you know, the, the, the uh, interests of the ruling elite, the factors of the ruling elite who want to now have a cold war with China, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's been frustrating. A couple of things I wanted to touch upon. I, I, the precautionary principle, I actually did my master's thesis about that. And it's something that has, that was purposely quashed in this country. And it's something that I think a lot of people believe in terms of our public health and in terms of like, um, you know, chemicals in our environment that we use that it's basically, you know, take precaution and do no harm until you know that something is safe. And I think a lot of people assume that's how we operate in this country, and we don't. And, you know, what taking precaution in terms of this pandemic means that if you can stay at home and you have the means to do that, you stay at home. If you can wear a mask, you know, all these studies about how effective they are, clearly, they're, they're not going to be 100% effective. And clearly, putting something over your mouth is either going to protect you somewhat or protect someone else from you somewhat. So why not do it, right? It is a little minor inconvenience. The biggest problem I have with masks is the waste because it's an environmental nightmare. And it's. It, I read an article where, not surprisingly, it's ending up choking our, our already choked oceans and waterways. But I mean, using a... a a mask that you can wash and replace and not using disposable masks. It's, it's a simple thing that you can do and a minor inconvenience just as a precaution, even if you don't believe in it. But the, the other thing I was going to talk about is like, 
Um, the, yeah, what you said, I have, I've had some friends um, think about this as kind of a, a conspiracy by the government and an authoritarian kind of conspiracy. And, and I reacted the same way you did. Like, this is global. And it, it, there, we couldn't have had a conspiracy from all these governments around the world and all these scientists around the world to pretend this is something when it's not, right? So I, 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 I'm with you there. But and the other thing I wanted to mention is, is these sort of conspiracy theories. And I hate to talk about that because so much of truth is, is being lumped in conspiracy theory too, just to dismiss it. But um, I think the skepticism of a lot of Americans is really understandable because we have been um, torn down as a society and as individuals by our government and by the people in charge who, who are, it's basically a plutocracy and an oligarchy. So it's by public officials and it's by the corporate, you know, heads who are in charge of basically our lives. And so for people to be skeptical, it's so understandable and it's, it's almost, I, I have empathy for that because it's almost terrible that the same people who've created this skepticism because of their lying and their corruption and, and what they've done to our society and putting people in such dire straits and creating such economic inequality. Now they're telling us to trust them and believe in them and follow all these rules. And some of the rules are really making people's lives worse because we are not giving them a safety net. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. You know, it's just so hard, you know, to, to, say, believe in science and believe in your public officials and they they're, they just want to do you well because that's just not true, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and we know that. Yeah. And, and what happens is when you've created such skepticism in people and we, you've created people who are at the brink and having such a hard time, it's totally understandable to, for them to look at our government and just say, fuck you, <laughs> you know? Oh, Totally. Totally. And, and the reason, and, and like I said, if, 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 if this was just something going on in the United States, I think that I would have a lot more skepticism than I do about, right. about, about, about COVID, right? But from the beginning, I've been hearing about, hearing from news from overseas. And I've been knowing, I've been knowing about it from that standpoint. And so for right. me, it was a real thing before it got here, you know? Right. I'm like, oh, it's another disease in China that they're dealing with. It's like a contagious thing. Oh, look, they're all putting their masks on because that's what they do there. Like, you know, because yeah. that is just what they do there. They don't oh, have. Oh, yeah, just for, for their air quality. They do it all the time. Yeah, they do it for air quality all the time. And then it's also just more of a, it's just more of a cultural thing to do if you've been sick you know, mm -hmm. or think you are or something like that. And so it, it, it isn't, it's just, it's another, I, I've always been aware of culture of, of how so many things are relative to culture, you know, and how something can be, you know, very true for one culture and then like very false for another, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or, or mm -hmm. very central to one culture and very marginal to another. I've always seen mm -hmm. those things. And so I've always been aware from a very early age that those things that are presented to us as the truth, you know, in the United States right. are only the United States version of the truth. I've right. always known that, you know, and so, 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 you know, with the whole mask thing, like, well, there doesn't really seem to be any place else in the world where this is being presented as a freedom issue. It's mm -hmm. being presented as a health issue everywhere else. And in Asia, mm -hmm. you know, and, and in East Asia, where we have, you know, literally decades uh, of seeing what happens in populations that regularly wear masks, you know, just when they're sick and then who are used to wearing them in mass when something comes along. I mean, we have, we have so much data. We have so yeah. much fucking data showing us that this works. And the fact that, that it's not a health issue here and that it's a quote freedom issue is just, it's just, it's a peculiarity of this culture to put it politely. You know what I mean? But I think, I think one of the problems is that the, that people don't have you know, the only freedom I feel we have in this country is the freedom to shop and the freedom to consume. Right. And so I think people 
even the people who say we're the freest country in the world, we're the best country in the world, those, you know, nationals, I think they deep down feel that they don't have freedom too, because we really don't. And I think that's part of it. I think that's because they, they don't, we, we don't have the kind of freedom that we are told we have, like in our constitution and in the declaration of independence. And so people are, people are seeking freedom in, in places they can, you know? Yeah. I mean, and so again, it's part of our pathology and part of what we have created. We've created this so that people are, you know, not are skeptical and feeling that their freedoms are being taken away. It's the same people who are telling them to do something and the, and the, the people who are telling them to wear masks may be correct, but after all these years of pounding people down and get, taking away their freedoms, people are going to react by saying, you know, no, I, I feel this little piece of freedom and this is where I'm going to use it, even when it's destructive. And the other part of it is that we don't have a collective society. We don't have a society where we care about other people. We have an individualistic society, which, again, has been created by the powers that be. And because we have an individualistic society, we're not looking out for maybe for our our um family and extended family but in america that's what it is you you look out for your family and for the most part we don't look out for our communities and we don't look out for everybody else that's not what we're trained to do so you know saying wearing a mask is helpful to everyone around you well you, you've taught us for our whole lives that you shouldn't really care about everyone around you, you should be, be competing with everyone around you that's what we've learned in america yeah. So, of course, we're not going to care so much about what what our actions do to others around us. Yeah. No, it makes total sense. I, I don't know if you saw the essay I wrote a couple of weeks ago where I was like, what if Trump had been a mask person? Yes. The, right. You know, because yes, cause, exactly. cause, cause the issue was kind of a blank slate before this year, like a year right. ago. If I'd been like, so what's your political stance on on masks? You would have been like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, <laughs> right. it, it wasn't <laughs> right. an issue. There was no political yeah. stance on the issues. And so and so, yeah, if you know. Back in March, if Trump had been like, you know, those dirty Chinese, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to give us this disease. They're trying to take over and the way to protect ourselves mm -hmm. as Americans is to wear a mask and put one on. Well, guess what? Everyone would be wearing a fucking mask now and they'd be so proud of it, you know? Yeah. Like, because, because it was a blank, it was a blank slate there, you know? And, and, and all the reasons that you just put out there for why people reject it. Well, absolutely. Those are true. And it could have just gone the other way too. Yeah. You know, because yep. that we're just that easy to manipulate here, you know? I mean, I, yep. I think that that was really something that was really shown in 2022 is just that, like, wow, look at how the population of the United States, and again, across the board, educated to uneducated, left to right, it's just so easy to manipulate us now, yeah. you know? I mean, the whole thing with, like, you know, electing not Trump, you know, like that was just such a game in that in mm -hmm. that way, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, did we discuss, you know, foreign policy as as part of this mm -hmm. election at all? I mean, did we discuss many issues at all, except, you know, maybe when Bernie was running, he was bringing up issues. But past that, when he dropped out, was there any issue other than not Trump? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and what a what a um. I mean, I, it was disappointing when he dropped out. And I mean, he was a very seriously flawed candidate. I haven't voted for right. a Democrat for president since 92. Right. I, yep. I, I, I might have voted for him, though, if he'd, I, I was, you know, I, I would have voted for him if he'd gotten the nomination just because all the young people wanted him in. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we need to support the young people, you know, but like, mm -hmm. it was so disappointing when he dropped out at that point where it's like, oh, wait a minute. I thought you had this whole thing of like, not me, us. Yeah. Well, wait yeah. a minute. That wasn't us making that decision for you to drop out. Yeah. That was just you making that decision. But going back to the the pandemic, one more thing I wanted to oh, add please. because, uh, and this could be very controversial, but um, now we see the vaccines coming. Oh, this out is an interesting and, topic. Mm -hmm. Uh. Well, I worked, my first job out of college when I was thinking about going into the medical profession was I worked in clinical research, which is studying um, drugs, you know, new drugs and testing them on people. Um, and I, I was very disheartened by the whole thing. Um, what I was studying were 
were medications. Um, one of which was, um, it was a painkiller that we really was just, they were trying to get it to be approved for a different use. It was used orally and they wanted to use it in an injection. So it wasn't something that I felt was, was scary in terms of risk and safety. Um, the other thing that I studied at the time was what's called an antiemetic, which is something that keeps you from feeling nauseated and throwing up. And the, the, these things are often used after surgery. And because when you have surgery, um, you, in order to go under in an operation and to be under anesthesia, you're basically getting a drug overdose and then you're reversing the drug overdose. So your body is trying to get rid of this stuff, you know, and, but you can't leave, um, you can't leave the hospital and you can't be dis uh, discharged after surgery if you're still throwing up and you're still nauseated and you're going to be nauseated because of the drug overdose they gave you basically. Right. Um, so I was a little more hesitant with this study because I kept thinking maybe people really actually need to have some nausea and vomiting. Maybe that's the natural process for getting rid of this stuff. And, may, you know, sometimes that can be problematic, obviously. But, you know, it's just this this whole drug thing is we're adding one to the other. This, you know, the surgery gives you this and then we need something to deal with after the surgery. You know, it's that kind of thing. And so the whole process of clinical research um Really, I felt like a lot of it was unethical and I was very leery about it. And I think a lot of drugs are being tested that don't need to be tested. They're all, you know, so much of it is about making money and putting new drugs on the market. And um, and anyway, so going back to the vaccines, I do know a bit about risk and a bit about scientific uncertainty and a bit about how these trials work and how long it takes and how the FDA works and how scientists and doctors running these trials work, because I did also see scientists who were, I don't want to say fudging the data, but are, were loose about data because they expected an outcome and wanted that outcome. And I personally um, am a little concerned with the timeline of these vaccines and the fact that they're brand new mRNA technology that has never been used before. Um, and that we we've only been doing this for several months now and we don't know long-term consequences of these vaccines. So. Right. Well, it's, not, it's impossible not to, mention, to know what the long-term right. effects are right now. Mm -hmm. So to say that these are safe and effective is really disingenuous, I think. Right. And I think this is part of what our whole problem is, is that the people in charge are, they believe this. I don't think they mean to do harm to people, but they, they're a little loose with the truth because they feel like they have to market this to people, you know, to end this pandemic. And of course they need to market this to people to end this pandemic with vaccines because we can't end in another way because people are suffering too much because of all the things we talked about, because we're not offering people a universal basic income and we're not giving people a social safety net so that they can't, you know, just wear their masks and social distance and do the other things that might've ended this pandemic months ago. Right. 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 And so it's like a total vicious cycle. No, it is a vicious I, I cycle. I am concerned about the risks. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, yeah, I think it's, 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 I mean, and it didn't, the, the, it's interesting to me that, of course, one thing that hasn't been reported at all in the United States press is that the Chinese have been working on vaccines as well, you know? And mm -hmm. I read a great article by Sarah Flounders, who I had on the podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, talking about the different response in the United States and China to COVID. And of course, it was very different, you know, uh, one was very mm -hmm. effective and ours hasn't been, you know, basically to mm -hmm. sum it all up, you know, and mm -hmm. she wrote an article talking about how there's, you know, four uh, pharmaceutical companies in China that have developed a total of five vaccines altogether. At least two of these companies are are um, publicly owned or owned by the, the Chinese government, you know? Right. And they're using uh, older, lower tech technology that doesn't need to be kept at negative 70 degrees. It's just regular right. refrigeration is fine, right? You know? Mm -hmm. And they... Um, you know, and they, they've been getting all this stuff ready because they're like, oh, well, there's this pandemic. People are going to need this vaccine. And their plans are to get this to like South America, to Africa and to other countries in the, quote, developing world, you know. Right. 
because mm -hmm. they're actually pretty, they're doing fine there. So now they can turn mm -hmm. to like helping other people, you know, and you know, mm -hmm. well, guess what? They've actually got scientists too, and they've got like a well-developed medical system and they, you know, and it, it has, it, it, it lacks some of the, the, uh, uh, problems that we have here and that, that there's not the corporate ownership that's going on there. Yep. There's not the profit motive that's going on there, you know, right? right? And they've actually been getting this out a little bit ahead of the United States as well, right? So mm -hmm. I look at that and I'm like, okay, so it's, it's possible to do this better than we are doing it here, right? So mm -hmm. we don't need to just throw the whole idea of vaccines out entirely because, because look here, they're doing it better, you know? Like, mm -hmm. like we can look at the situation to be like, okay, there's things to criticize about or to, or to be worried about, about, about vaccines in general. And then there's things to worry about, about the vaccines that are being offered to us here in the United States that are their own problems. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I lived in Portland for a while. I knew a lot of anti-vaxxers there. And I also mm -hmm. think that that term is, um, is, is, is used as a, as, as a, as kind of a slur unnecessarily as well. I mean, yes. there's people who are not, who are not, you know, strictly speaking anti-vaccination, but they're, they're skeptical about it. And they're looking at things that, you know, I haven't looked into enough to know, but, but like, well, it does seem interesting to me that children are now being given so many more vaccines than they yes. were when I was Absolutely. young. It's like, well, okay. Right. And, and I have read enough to know that like, no, this stuff isn't tested that well necessarily. I mean, you know, the, the, the sort of, well, the, 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 there's, there's a faith that, that some people are just like, oh, it's fine. And it's like, well, no, wait a minute. You can't just say, oh, it's fine yeah. about anything that happens here. Yes. <laughs> and this pejorative with the anti-vaxxers, um, you know, I understand it because there has been harm done with measles outbreaks that are happening when they didn't need to be. But there's, it's again, it's we we will not talk about the nuance. We think people are too stupid, and that's kind of our marketing too. You know, Edward Bernays, who started advertising and marketing, was basically trying to control people, and it's like so many um, science. I don't know if scientists themselves, but yeah, some of them. We we think people are too stupid to get the nuance, and that we just have to make it simplified, and that I think causes more harm than telling people the truth and trying to get through the nuance because when it comes to vaccines like um there's so many different kinds of viruses and diseases that we get vaccinated for and the vaccines work in different ways you know like we get measles mumps and rubella that you and i got when we were kids and we're vaccinated for life you get a flu vaccine and it changes every year and i don't think people really know that the flu vaccine is only 40 percent effective and that because the flu mut mutates every year a lot of times the vaccines are not effective for the flu strain or that you have to wait till later in the season for the right vaccine that's effective for that flu strain and you know it's 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 very dependent upon what specifically you're talking about um you know uh about I don't know, about five years ago, um, pertussis, which is who whooping cough, was going around in um, the area where I was living. And I went to the doctor for a physical and she said, would you mind getting this vaccine because children are getting in and we want to get herd immunity? And I said, sure. You know, I don't want people getting whooping cough. But at the same time, I didn't take the flu vaccine because I know it's kind of like in some ways a panacea and it's not necessarily useful and it doesn't necessarily do what they're claiming it does every year. So, right. yeah, there is a lot of nuance in this. And this pejorative of anti-vaxxers only makes it worse, I think. Right. Right. No, I, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think that kind of labeling ever helps, you know. And I recently listened to, um, a podcast. Uh, I don't know if you ever listened to Behind the Bastards. That's a really great podcast that Robert Evans does, you know. Mm -hmm. And he got into the anti vaccination movement and he had one whole episode about, um, oh, I, I can't remember the, the Andrew. I can't remember his name now, but. Wakefield. Yes, thank you, Andrew Wakefield. Right. Yeah. So, 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 I'm just going to tell the story the briefly. Whole thing with autism. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm going to tell the story briefly because I think it's a good one. Because one of the things you always hear, you know, from from people who are skeptical of the vaccines, is like, oh, there's this connection between autism and vaccines, like. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. anyway, you know, Robert Evans gets into it. and He's like, okay, this all comes from 
Andrew Wakefield. And it all mm-hmm. comes from this one study that he did in the late 90s mm-hmm. in Britain. And mm-hmm. there was like a few problems with this study. One, uh, he was, he was testing on the effects of the combined vaccination of measles with, with a couple of other things. And uh, a few months before he did this and published his work, he himself developed a standalone measles vaccination that he wanted Mm -hmm. to market, right? Mm -hmm. So he had a financial reason why he wanted to cast aspersions on the current Mm -hmm. one that was there, right? So that was one thing that was wrong with it. Another thing that was wrong with that study was that there was only 12 or 14 people in it. Yes. And, yes. And that, he fudged the data. He fudged uh, what their conditions were when they came in. He fudged their conditions yeah. later. He he fudged yeah. the data. Like it wasn't. I think it wasn't repeatable. I, I, if I remember, he they they were people he may have known too, and I'm not even sure if he had controls. There were no, so many no, problems. No, he didn't have yeah. controls, right? So he fudged it, and then the the other part because there was three parts. The other part was that. Uh, these people were provided by a lawyer who was trying to make a court case uh, that this this vaccination was causing autism, and so he wanted scientific proof of yeah. it, right? So, yeah. which is yeah, right. it's so, called the funding effect, right? So the funding effect. So it's like, okay, this was a complete crapola study, right? And and it, it at the time all this wasn't known, and it actually got published in like the Lancet or whatever. I right? was just gonna say, and yet all of this made it to the Lancet, which is another issue when it comes to academic publication. Right. And uh, I, I would just want to give kudos to Retraction Watch, which is this organization that. I get emails every day that talk about um, the problems with peer review, the problems with academic studies and retractions. Right, right. I've heard of them before. Yeah, no, they're they're I, I, yeah, they're they're cool, and that's important to keep up with that stuff. Yeah, because the because yeah. the Lancet ended up retracting all this in 2011. Like, but the fact that it got through, you know, everything and was published in the first place is a real issue. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But you know, that one was, that story was running on for 12 years before they finally mm-hmm. retracted it. It was too late at that point. And really all the whole narrative of autism vaccines comes from that. And so mm-hmm. I was like, okay, okay. When I heard that, I'm like, okay, I am now, I, I, I now have moved on that scale. I've now moved further away from the, the vaccine skeptical side because I'm like, wait mm-hmm. a minute. That's been yeah. a lot of my concern. That's been a lot of what I've been hearing. Wait a minute. There's a huge percentage that was all like just coming down to that, you know? So yeah, yeah like that was, that was, that was the problem. Also, you know, some people, um, you know, and again, I know this from my experience in Portland is that, is that in the natural health communities, there's a lot of, um, there's, there, there's, uh, well, there's the, there's the, the well-reasoned skepticism for the medical establishment, right? And then there's sort of a contrarianism, right? Mm -hmm. Which is different. Mm -hmm. Contrarianism is no longer skepticism. Contrarianism is starting from the assumption that anything that comes out of this particular institution is bullshit, you know? Right. And that right. all of and that the opposite of whatever they say is always going to be true. And it's like, well now wait a minute, right. that's not skeptical at all. That's just a different kind of faith and that's a contrarianism. You know, and like yeah, yeah. Bruce Bruce Levi, Bruce Levine was talking about this in our in I the was podcast. Just yeah. Say that. yeah. There's there's one thing to be anti authoritarian and to listen to people and to try to judge it based on, you know, knowledge and evidence and then to just be contrary just to be contrary. Right. Right. And so a lot of the natural health community, unfortunately, is contrarian, not skeptical. Yeah. And so and yeah. so it's like, oh, well, we're going to reject vaccines because they're part of that establishment. Well, then I got into the history more of it more. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Actually, vaccine technology or vaccines as a concept doesn't come from Western medicine. It comes first from the Chinese who were experimenting with it back in like the year 1000, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe as far back as 200 B C, right? So, mm-hmm. so they were doing. And besides that, it was also a tradition in African folk medicine, 
for many hundreds of years. And in fact, the very first vaccinations that took place in the United States in the early 1700s that were done by Cotton Mather, who you've probably heard of, the famous reverend at that time, right? He Mm -hmm. learned about the concept of vaccination from an African slave who he owned. (laughs) Interesting. The first vaccinations in the United Uh. States happened from knowledge taken from an African slave. <laughs> yeah, and and it's just again, and so we we have this um, we have this whole thing that comes about where people don't want to have any vaccinations at all, and it's it's a healthy skepticism, but that's gone out of control, just like this denial or this this skepticism about COVID in general, because people weren't being forthright and people weren't being honest and people in power were being corrupt. Right. And it's just, yeah. Right. And it's like, you, so you have to have sympathy or empathy for those who come down on that side because it's understandable why that would happen. Totally when understandable. Have, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But it was also interesting to find out this information to be like, well, well, wait a minute. If your skepticism is, is, is for the medical, med- medical establishment of the West, well, vaccinations don't come from that. Yeah. Actually, you can go ahead and think of them as being alternative medicine. Actually, it was traditional Chinese medicine first. Right. Then it and was who, African and who's medicine. And to say that everything in traditional Chinese medicine is, is the alternative? You know, I remember, um, when I was, Years ago, like 25 years ago, I was talking with someone about um, the problems with sort of Western medicine and sort of the corruption and the the for-profit motive and that that makes everyone reliant on um, medication rather than health. And and this woman said to me, so are you so you're into Eastern medicine? And I said, no, (laughs) I'm not as much into medicine as I am into health and prevention and precaution right you know and you know it's everybody has to have this flip side and you know so it's not it's not that eastern or western medicine are bad in themselves it's and it's not that they're totally right or wrong in themselves there's nuance in there and i guess yeah the contrarian is just going to say western medicine no good eastern medicine's the way to go and the non contrarian and the conformist is going to say eastern medicine is you know hokey and and quacky quackery and western medicine is pure science and there's a whole lot of nuance in between and a whole lot of money making and profit and corruption all around <laughs> yeah 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 no totally you know you know, but but also, you know, at, at this point, just for 2020 and for the pandemic, we can look at things and be like, oh, look, the Chinese just did a hell of a lot better job than we did. We are so closed off in this country in so many ways, and we're we just think we're the epitome of society and of the way to do things. And part of that is, you know, I would. Some people say that we need, we all need to travel and we need to see other societies, but I don't know that that necessarily helps because I think a lot of people travel and just um, keep their their American framework as they go to a new city around the world and they stay in their hotel and they eat the food they want to eat and they might get a little bit of the culture, but I don't know if traveling necessarily makes you aware of different ways of seeing the world and being in the world. But for sure, Americans think we're the epitome of, of everything in so many ways. And we just cannot imagine that there's another way to do things. Well, and we wouldn't even have to travel if we didn't want, I mean, when it comes to food, for example, I mean, yeah. food from all over the world is available here. I mean, if you, if you like food, the United States is actually one of the greatest places to be that's ever been, you know, and that there's right. so much food from all over the world that's available here. I mean, you know, I visited my parents in Omaha earlier this year and I was like, Oh, I want to go to a Middle Eastern grocery store and pick up something. And there were several, right. you know, in Omaha, yeah. you know, and I had yeah. the same experience that I had when I went to one there as I do in any other city, which is that I'm usually the only sort of white European looking guy in there, you know, and like everyone else, mm-hmm. you know, seems to be, you know, f- you know, f- f- from the Middle East, you know, who's who's in there. And it's like, well, 
that's just so sad because there's all these great things that I can buy in here that are really tasty and delicious and they're great prices. And like, like there's so much mixing that could be happening in the United States that isn't, you know? But, uh, and unfortunately, I think it's funny because we're the, we're, we've been the melting pot of the world, as they say, and we're getting all of this wonderful cuisine that we've gotten for several decades now, at least. But we're the, the cultural aspects of other cultures coming to America is not happening. I mean, I know from teaching lots of immigrants from um, Mexico and Central America when I was a, a public school teacher, and that, that those were my students, you know, no white students, basically, that they all assimilate to the American culture. They may still have some of their traditional foods, but almost everything else, even their food, you know, they assimilate, especially the younger children, and they start eating McDonald's and stuff, and they, and they get progressively more ill. But it is a, it is a shame, because we, we are a melting pot, but everybody seems to assimilate rather than um, bring great aspects of their own cultures. And it's not necessarily their fault, but that's what seems to happen here. Right, right. I mean, and, I, you know, I think that the days of that are possibly, you know, well, I mean, they're definitely numbered in some way. It's just it's just how how, how close is that? I mean, I was listening to Abby and Robbie Martin's um, podcast before our conversation here this morning, and they were referring to, they're having kind of a 2020 look back too, and they were, mm -hmm. uh, and, they, and um, several times they were referring to the U.S. as being a failed state, you know? Absolutely, yeah. I was going to ask you if you thought so. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, how could it not be a failed state when our, what do we have, all these people who have no health care, all of the millions and millions of people um, in poverty and the extreme inequality in income and in wealth? Absolutely, it's a failed state. Um, but yeah, and I was just going to say, you know, trying to tie this together, that the assimilation is part of the problem. We need different ideas on how to live, on how to have a culture, on how to have a society. And bringing that to this country is what could make it not a failed state anymore. But the powers that be insist upon things as they are, because, of course, the, the things as they are benefit the powers that be. I mean, it seems like the internet should be helping us with this too, because here it is, it's this network, you know, that you should be able to learn about all these things from all over the world, you know, and yet that isn't really how it operates. And the other day, you know, someone posted something on social media about how, you know, uh, um, China was cracking down on, on these people for looking at foreign press or something like that, you know? And, and I just mm -hmm. put this comment of like, well, we don't do that here because people just don't even bother to look at foreign press. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, speaking of that, I do have something hopeful from 2020. Oh, good. So um, I'm trying to remember when Evo Morales was ousted and the coup happened in Bolivia. Oh, that was in late um, 2019. Okay. But now um, they had a democratic election, which they had when he was elected and he was overthrown. Yep. And he's back. He was in exile in Mexico. He's he's back. He's not in power, but his leftist um, government that helped so many in poverty and so many of the d indigenous people um, in Bolivia is back in power. Yes, so that's a positive outcome. Yeah, no, that was definitely that was definitely good news. And there was good news in Venezuela with their last elections, too. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, there, there's there's some hope, you know, uh, if, if we look beyond our borders, you know, so I think there's hope for mm -hmm. for humans. And I think that there's, you know, hope for in a in a broader sense, but I I just I don't know how much how much there is for for us here, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not I, sure. I think it, it's going to get a lot worse before it it gets better, if it can get better. I'm not sure it can get better um, in terms of the environment. That that's you know when we talk about these vaccines and we talk about COVID, what I see all around me is all of you know, all of the vaccine research and all that goes into making and using these vaccines is so destructive to the environment and so um, natural resource intensive. And I don't know if you know that one of the ingredients in vaccines that keeps them from getting um, growing bacterial in the vaccine itself is 
they they need to take this chemical component from horseshoe crabs. Oh no. Yeah, I'll I'll send you um, some information on that. But it is it is just horrific how we are. They call it milking the horseshoe crab for its blood because it has this chemical component found nowhere else that prevents a bacterial outbreak in you know the vaccines as they're kept in storage, and it's it's just horrific. So. I mean, as much as we say, okay, we're doing this great thing, we're creating vaccines, we might get over this pandemic, but we're doing it, and this is part of our whole way of life, in a way that's so destructive to the environment. And all of the you know, disposable resources we're using to, to keep safe and, and with treating people who have COVID and, and through, you know, in the hospitals and stuff, it just, it's so alarming on a... a ecological scale i that, i'd heard that about the horseshoe crabs years ago but i'd forgotten all about it there's always these things going on i suppose yeah yeah and so it's it's like the, again this is why we need to you know do a maybe a debriefing of this pandemic and think about ways that we can deal with it that are that are more ecologically sound but i don't see anyone anyone doing that I mean, all there is is this glorifying the vaccines and glorifying the technology, which is completely unsustainable. So. Right. Yeah, I don't know much about the mRNA, mRNA technology, and I'm seeing lots of different kinds of doubts out there, and I don't know which ones to believe and which ones not to believe. Well, one thing I'm that's just confused, not true you know? is that it's, it's, it's not going to change your DNA. No. <laughs> this is, it's not going into your cells and going into the nucleus of your cell, and it's not going to change your DNA. mRNA is, is um, a nucleic acid that is, that, crea- that is the blueprint for a protein. And what, what happens is they inject this to make a protein that your body will react to because it's a foreign protein. It's the protein that the virus creates that's on the shell of the virus and your body will, you know, create a whole immune response to this protein. But the thing is, you know, putting in a foreign MRNA that creates a foreign protein, um, who knows, it may be perfectly safe. And, and maybe even if that's safe, the MRNA itself comes in this nanolipid vehicle where in which it's delivered into your bloodstream and we don't know enough about the nanolipid and if that's safe for our bodies so you know these are so it's funny because there there are potential risks maybe they're not a risk at all but but then there's conspiracy or whatever you want to call them you know uninformed um uh things going out there that are really not what the potential risks could be at all right Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. It, so, there's, there's there's just a lot that we're just not gonna that we're just not going to know for a while. Yeah. 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 So the one thing that we didn't really talk too much about today was uh, the the environment. Did, was there anything that you wanted to throw in that from from this year? I mean, you know, the the carbon levels just hit a a high again, but you know, of course, that's just in terms of of, of climate. But, you know, I know that there's other things that happen, too. I guess, I, I mean, I guess we touched upon it in many ways, but the, the thing that, that concerns me is that, first of all, when we encounter something like a pandemic, everything about the environment goes by the wayside, and it doesn't have to. Um, but we're just so used to this convenience lifestyle where everything is disposable. And so, you know, all of these things we use – to protect ourselves and that we use in medicine that are just disposable um, products um, are creating an environmental nightmare. And I want to mention this Dr. Peter Sai, who created the N95 mask. He, he's an, um, a materials engineer. He actually, I think he's in his 70s or 80s now, and he w- he's been working on a non-disposable N95 mask. Um, he knows the problem with the environment and he knows the problem with waste and that has gotten so little press. But I, I do think um, we, we, I guess it's, we need to stop looking at everything in a vacuum. And I'm very concerned about the environment because of all this waste that has been generated from this pandemic. And also because of what we're doing right now, this online environment, 
It's completely unsustainable. And everyone, beyond the fact that it's also inequitable, but in terms of the environment, um, our, our computers, our devices, the internet, the server farms, this is all very unsustainable, but yet we're seeing it as the answer to our problems in many ways. And that that really concerns me. And I think that's something that we need to have a further discussion about that's coming out of 2020 and out of this pandemic. That's a really good point. I haven't really heard anyone else mention that at all. Well, I, I think it's because um, a lot of what even people who are concerned about the environment are riding on is is technology and quote unquote, smart technology and internet and grids relying on internet and the internet of things. And the fact is that none of that is actually ecologically sustainable. And so it's, it's not something people really want to talk about. But I think it's something that really needs to be discussed. Yeah, I mean, the fact is that we need to step back from from all of that. If we were being smart, Mm -hmm. you know, right now, we would be using the resources that we have left right now and the dwindling wealth that we have left right now to retool society to a much more simple, uh, uh, mm-hmm. less complex and less technological level. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind yeah. of what I want to work on and what I really want to talk about and stuff is that kind of thing, how to take apart this beast, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, me too. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I, I get a little frustrated mm-hmm. with uh, how things start to focus on all these little details that don't really matter, like who's president, you know, and and... You know, yeah. it's like, oh, it's so much more important that we change everything that we're doing than, than that we change who the person who's in charge of it, you know? Yes. And um, by the way, just before we started talking, um, Al Gore came out with a piece, uh, an opinion piece, and I can't remember if it's in the New York Times or where. But um, basically, it was a... It, it, was basically a hope for the Biden administration, and it relied on techno salvation and and you know our increasing technology to solve our ecological problems, basically climate change, because that's really all he focuses on. And again, that was very disheartening to see because I don't see any solutions in what he's proposing in in terms of taking apart this beast, as you said, and um, you know just to see that as the voice who's supposedly concerned about the environment and the voice out there for going forward. It's, it's not, it's not where we need to go as far as I can see. And, and I think you'd agree. It's not about taking apart this beast that is our way of life that needs to be dismantled. If we're, if we're to survive basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know people personally who, are skeptical about climate change, but who are opposed to pollution in general, you know, and who are into organic food and they're against the use of pesticides. They are opposed to all the plastics going into the oceans and all this. I mean, the whole litany of, of environmental things that are happening besides climate change are, are things that lots of other people do see, you know? I mean, there's people who mm. want to save the wolves. There's people who don't want to see the trees cut down, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? But who are mm-hmm. skeptical of the climate issue in part because what they're seeing is some very real attempts by some people out there in the ruling elite to use the climate um, situation as an excuse for more centralized control. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we need to see the climate and, um, and, you know, pollution and toxification and waste and plastic and pesticides all is just symptoms of the disease which is our i like to call it our way of life yeah you know our consumer capitalist materialist uh over consumptive way of life right. and so in, unless we get down to the basics like that we're not going to find any relief and, and it go, it's exactly what you said we have to dismantle this whole beast not just different and we can dismantle it from different parts but the whole thing needs to go and we can't pretend that we're going to keep going on like with this highly technological um way of life with all of these devices and that's going to be our salvation that if if that's what we're we're riding on then we're 
completely diluted. Right, right. Do you think that that the disturbances of 2020 helped more people to see these things or not? I don't. I don't. You know, I, I what what really got me was, you know, instead of saying, for, let's let's take education. Instead of saying, you know what, just can students maybe take some time off? Um, you know, maybe we should just shelter in place, and they should be learning other other kinds of skills and other kinds of things that they could learn. Does it really matter that they get a year, say, that they are not in a regular classroom? Actually, there's a lot you can learn outside of a classroom. And instead, we said we all have to get online and we all have to have these Zoom classes. And we and in New York, where I think it is one in five in New York City, one in five children are um, homeless. We were more concerned with getting those kids a computer or some device so that they could still be in class online than getting them a home. And so, yeah, I don't know that we've learned anything in terms of, of that kind of lesson about how we, we really need to dismantle it. I mean, it was more like, no, we need more of this. Yeah, I feel like what you're pointing out there is, is, is one of the false choices that we were presented with. And I feel like that was one of the themes of 2020. And indeed, it's been a theme of American life, but yes. it really came in so much this year of these false choices. So you're describing this false choice of like, well, either all the kids are learning, are doing distance, distance learning, as they call it, right? You know, with, mm -hmm. with the technology, or we're reopening the schools, and that's it. There's our choice. It's mm -hmm. this thing or that mm -hmm. thing, and there's nothing else that we're, that we're, they're deciding. You know, I mean, so many false choices, the whole Biden or Trump thing obviously was another, you know, false choice. The whole thing of like uh, of either uh, reopening the economy, you know, or I mean, like that, that whole reopening the economy was another false choice where it's like, mm -hmm. well, no, what we need mm -hmm. to be doing is taking care. You know, I mean, yeah, shutting it down or reopening it. Well, no, let's let's look at what any other country in the world, which is doing, which is which is, you know. Uh, uh, providing for their people, you know, I mean, I, the, the, yeah. The, yeah, false, I felt like false dichotomy, false dichotomy, you is. know, and so yes, that, I think that's, and I think that, yeah, that's been a theme of 2020. And I think it's illuminated because that is part of our whole society is false dichotomies. And that's something that, yeah, maybe it would be great for you to just throw that out there and say, this is something that really needs to be gone, these false dichotomies. Yeah, because we're all asked to like pick a side on on any of these things. It's like, well, I don't want to pick mm -hmm. either of these sides. Yeah, I'm not interested yeah. in picking either of these sides. You know, exactly. There's so much, and it, you know, it's the kind of thing that they use. Well, you don't like capitalism. Well, what do you want? Communism? Look at the Soviet Union. You want, you know, and it's like, can't you imagine something else? Anything else? Yeah. You know. Yeah, the media has, a, and and of course the educational system, but the media has a large part to play in this. Absolutely. I mean, and 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 that's, and it goes back to what we were saying. It's I, I, people who who might not even recognize these false dichotomies. They're feeling them, and they they're saying, "Well, this is not a good choice." And so sometimes they're coming down on one side or the other. But I think, um, I I think the problem is that we don't have the freedom to choose anything else. And people are feeling that. And that might be why people are making bad choices and, and coming out and doing things that they would not otherwise do. Cause this is what we're given these phony false dichotomies all the time. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and what that does is prevent us from ever discussing any real solutions. And it makes everything divisive too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's probably its purpose because it keeps us in control and it keeps us fighting amongst each other instead of fighting the powers that be who are controlling us. And how much of that, in your opinion, is actual policy and how much of that is just the shape of uh, our society in which even the rulers and even the people in charge of the media are actually uh, believing this stuff themselves? You know, I don't know. I think, I think that's a good question. I, I, I don't know if people believe it or they get to a point in their lives 
where they are so comfortable and they have so much um, wealth or power that they choose to believe it and they're more concerned with maintaining their own wealth and power and status. So it, it becomes like truth to them. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, these people all go to the same schools, you know, and are given the same <laughs> worldview. And here's what's acceptable. <laughs> here's what's not acceptable. <laughs> here's what your choices are, you know. And mm-hmm. so they're like, oh, well, these are the only things that are possible. It's, you know, sometimes right. I wonder how much of it is not um, how much of it is not, you know, intentional. Oh, we're trying to control everybody. And some of it is just a lot of people in charge who lack imagination. Well, yeah, and you discuss this a lot with Bruce Levine because I th- and I, he talked about anti-authoritarian people and the, and what I would say were more conformists. I don't know if he used that word, but I think um, I've seen that and I've kind of described it as there are people who are kind of I guess the anti-authoritarians could call, almost be thought of as leaders because they're not willing to be led by others necessarily unless. Um, they've really like vetted that person, that person's ideas. And then there are, I think, I think more people are just looking for someone to lead them. And so when you're looking for someone to lead you, you get, you know, you follow along with the rules and you follow along with what's supposed to be. I think that the the relief Mm -hmm. that many people have been expressing with the end of this year and and, and following the election has been one of the most misplaced things that I've seen the entire year. (laughs) I I feel the same way. I'm just thinking, well, and I feel like you haven't lived if you don't know it can get worse, unfortunately. Yeah. You know? (laughs) Yeah. Well, where's this relief coming from just because we're about to enter the new year of a calendar that was set up by a, a Pope 800 years ago, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a there's an element of superstition, and then there's an element of this, what I, I like to say is forced optimism and positivity in our society. Ah, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, and again, that's a whole nother um, topic for a, an entire podcast, but I... I I'm trying to think of someone who's written well about that. And I think Barbara Ehrenreich has written some things about the positivity culture and, and how we're forced to always look at, at, at in an optimistic way. And, and I, I really resent that and I really have a problem with it. And I think it, it creates delusion and it creates, um, um, on, un, not on we, but it creates, um, a lack of, of, power for action in many ways because you're it's kind of like you know just relying on hope rather than relying on actually changing things yeah without any any evidence you know this whole um uh, when a, when any door closed another one opens you know yeah mm-hmm. or things happen for a reason oh my god i hate that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep well, thanks so much for chatting with me today. I wanted to discuss the year and decompress with somebody who was going to, you know, be on a similar wavelength or who I could explore some of these ideas with. So I really appreciate you spending the time. Oh, it's always a pleasure. I know we go all over the place, but it, it, it's a great conversation. I always enjoy it. And um, I do want, because I know you're not going to sort of toot your own horn, but I want to tell everybody to read your um kind of end of year roundup called an end to stability, which is on your website and on counterpunch. Cause it's a great, um, comprehensive piece about this year and about the issues with our society and how things could change. Oh, well, thanks. I'm glad you appreciate it. I'll put a link in the, in the show notes. And could you tell us where we can follow your work? Um, well, right now I haven't been able to do much writing. I'm kind of, um, over occupied with um, you know a day job and with caregiving but um, I am doing because I can't write full pieces as much as I used to I am doing a lot of tweeting so you can follow me at Christine Mattis on Twitter and once I am able to get some more pieces out um, the website I'm usually at is rebelpleb.blogspot.com okay Twitter Twitter's kind of a hellscape though isn't it (laughs) 
You know, it is, and I try not to go too deeply in there, what what I've been doing on it, and I can't remember why I first um, joined it, because I, I am not really fond of social media, but like I said, since I haven't been able to write long pieces in a while, um, I'm trying to just vent and, and plant seeds on Twitter. As, um, as the wonderful Bill Hicks said in one of his most famous uh, stand-up routines when he was talking about marketing, he, he just said, you know, he was denouncing marketing and advertising and talking about all the, the ills of it. And he was just saying, I'm just planting seeds, just planting seeds out there. So that's what I'm trying to use Twitter. When I, when I see something or hear something and I have a different take on it or want to try to reframe it, I just try to throw something out there and, you know, not many people listen and not many people follow and I'm just planting seeds. Cool. Cool. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace. By the way, I really enjoyed your talk with Bruce Levine. That was fantastic. That was a really enjoyable one. And one of the reasons I started a podcast was to talk to him sometime, you know? Yeah, yeah. I've been enjoying reading his stuff because I, I mean, I, I knew about the studies with placebo showing that SSRIs really weren't doing anything for depression. And, and you know, I've been trying to find professionals who would say, Say anything like that. Of course, he's one of the few who do. But yeah, I mean, his criticism of psychology is something that should be out there, of course, and isn't because money making is to be had and that's more important than truth. <laughs>